My name is Sid. I'm one of the medical directors for MSF, along with one of my colleagues, Claire Mills, who uh, presented earlier today. Days like today and tomorrow, uh, they reinforce the importance and the, uh, the necessity of the use of operational research and innovation to help solve our many field challenges that we face now and we will face in the future. And overall, they help us to continuously improve the medical humanitarian response that we deliver for our patients and populations of the now and also of tomorrow. The purpose of this short presentation is to highlight the need and the responsibility collectively to use our medical data, our information that we collect, for far-reaching purposes. MSF, along with other medical humanitarian organizations, we combine the delivery of our healthcare in hand-in-hand -hand with the responsibility to bear witness, to expose and to document the unimaginable human suffering that many face in times of crisis. At times, we are compelled to speak publicly, to provoke a social and political response. For many who endure this suffering, possibly there is nothing worse than the neglect or indifference that the world shows towards them. For MSF, in every context where we work, we document, we expose the unmet needs we see in front of us. Then there are significant moments in history where we have felt compelled to speak out, from denouncing the forced relocation in Ethiopia in 1985, the inaction of the international community during the Rwanda genocide in 1984, and through our Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, we demanded an end to discriminate bombings of civilians in Chechnya. And now in the present, I want to highlight the plight of the Rohingya population, one of the most marginalized and at-risk populations in the world we see right now. In the early hours of 25th of August 2017, the Myanmar military launched clearance operations in Rakhine State as a response to coordinated attacks by the Rohingya armed groups on border guard police outposts. This resulted in an estimated 688,000 mainly Rohingya people from Rakhine State fleeing into neighboring Bangladesh. The speed and scale of the displacement resulted in a critical humanitarian emergency. The majority of these people are now living in makeshift settlements, either pre-existing or new, or amongst their host community in Cox's Bazar region in Bangladesh. In November 2017, MSF conducted five retrospective mortality studies amongst the Rohingya population living in Bangladesh. In total, survey teams conducted interviews with over 2,400 households. The recall period for the surveys covered roughly equal time periods before and after the 25th of August. Heads of households described the family structure and provided the date, the location, and cause of death of family members who died during the recall period. The findings were absolutely staggering. Um, they cannot go unnoticed, and they cannot go unanswered. We estimate that at least 9,000 Rohingya people died in Myanmar in Rakhine State. 73% were reported deaths were caused by violence. And therefore, we estimate at least 6,500 Rohingya people, in the most conservative estimations, um, are estimated to have been killed, of which 400 children under five. The majority of the deaths reported were due to gunshots and also shocking reports of people burned to death in their homes. The number of deaths reported in our surveys are likely to be underestimates. The surveys did not cover all the refugee settlements in, in Bangladesh. Uh, and nor did they account for the families who did not make it across the border into, uh, into Bangladesh. This is the clearest indication yet of the widespread targeted violence that started on the 25th of August when the Myanmar military, police and local militia launched the latest clearance operations in Rakhine State. The mortality surveys will be presented at this year's MSF Scientific Days, South Asia, so in July in New Delhi. To complement the surveys, we also conducted a total of 81 semi-structured interviews. Um, we interviewed 31 of our MSF, uh, well, interviewed 31 patients and caretakers who came to our MSF facilities, as well as 50 refugees living in the, uh, in the settlements. Here, I just wanted to highlight two of the horrific testimonies that, that we took. I'll just leave you to, to read. And then this is the second one.
We made public our surveys in December. We shared the report widely and has been used by other international organizations, human rights organizations, and the United Nations Special Reporters. The Myanmar authorities, their official estimates, um, they put out 500 people, which is a stark contract to our MSF estimates. The reaction from the Myanmar government to our mortality surveys was muted. Only two statements were published in English language press. In line with their general indifference to public international criticism, they were dismissive of the report, neither denying the contents nor naming MSF as the source. So what does the current situation look like in Myanmar? And I know I'm clearly going over time, so I apologize. <laughs> so this is the map, uh, and these are the, uh, the, the camps that MSF overall is, uh, is currently working in. The current situation remains precarious. It's an area prone to cyclones, heavy rain, uh, dense crowded populations, limited access to safe water, hygiene, sanitation conditions, and high risk of vaccine preventable diseases. September, from September to the end of February, uh, we saw 4,370 measles cases across all of the MSF facilities. We did two rounds of max vaccination campaigns organized by the MOH, which we supported. Diphtheria. We treated more than 4,600 people for diphtheria by the end of February, most between the ages of five and 14. During the peak of the outbreak, MSF was running three dedicated health facilities, contact tracing activities, and supporting the MOH with a vaccination program. The diphtheria outbreak will be presented by one of my colleagues, Kate White, in the next session after this. MSF also treated over 300 survivors of sexual and gender-based violence between August and March, aged between nine and 50 years. However, the real number, we just don't know. We only think that's probably the tip of the iceberg. Water and sanitation, we mounted a very large response. Um, activities included, included drilling boreholes, uh, a supply system, desludging all the trees, and actually constructing new ones. Across the border in Myanmar, independent international humanitarian organizations like ourselves are still blocked from accessing and operating in northern Rakhine. This very much leaves limited and honestly no access to essential care in those, in those contexts. I only have two slides remaining. Um, second to last slide, I, I wanted to make an acknowledgement. I just want to thank each and every member of the MSF field teams, other organization field teams, Bangladesh um, staff who have been working tirelessly and they continue to work in these camps in Bangladesh. I also just wanted to make acknowledgement to specifically the people that have been supporting, developing, and analyzing the mortality surveys that we reported on in December. And then I will just leave you with this. So this is a quote from uh, a speech given by James Obinsky, who was a former MSF international president. And this is part of his speech when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. I think many of you probably will have seen this. But for the ones that haven't seen this, I hope it inspires you as much as it actually inspires me. Thank you very much. <laughs>